let's get into our study of Psalm 118. Psalm 118, beginning at verse 1. We'll read the, uh, verses 1 through 9, and then we'll get into our study. Psalm 118, beginning at verse 1. The psalmist writes, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, because His mercy endures forever. Let Israel now say, His mercy endures forever. Let the house of Aaron now say, His mercy endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord now say, His mercy endures forever. I called on the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me and set me in a broad place. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear what can man do to me. The Lord is for me among those who help me. Therefore, I shall see my desire on those who hate me. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. This is the last of what is referred to as the halal or the praise psalms. This is a psalm that gives thanksgiving to God. This particular psalm is one of the psalms that was sung in a religious procession as the pilgrims went to the temple to worship the Lord. Not only is it one of the psalms of praise that would be, that would be sung in that fashion, this is a psalm that may very well have been sung by the Lord Jesus Christ that night that he was inaugurating uh, what we call communion that night in the upper room. The Bible tells us in Matthew, in chapter 26, verse 30, when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. The hymn that they sang may very well be Psalm 118, which was the conclusion of the Psalms of Praise. So as we, as we look at this particular psalm, this is one of those psalms that really gives to us an insight into the heart of Jesus Christ, especially into his heart as he was facing the cross. Remember with me that the Lord Jesus Christ, on one occasion, it's found in Luke's gospel, chapter 12, verse 50, how that Jesus said, I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how I am straightened or how distressed I am until it be accomplished. The Bible in Hebrews, chapter 12, verse 2, referring to Jesus, tells us to look to Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus Christ had a baptism to be baptized with and greatly desired the accomplishment of that baptism. It was referring to his death on the cross. How did he view the cross? What was he looking to? He was looking to the joy that was set before him. He endured the cross. He endured the shame because there was something worth doing. What was it that he was looking forward to? Well, one, Jesus Christ was looking forward to being with his Father once again. And two, he was looking forward to accomplish the task of salvation, of redemption, in order that you and I might be with him in heaven. And so when Jesus Christ was facing the cross, this is a psalm we know that he sang. And so beginning at verse 1, notice how the psalmist begins. He says, "'Give thanks to the Lord, for he's good, because his mercy endures forever.'" He says, let Israel now say, his mercy endures forever. Let the house of Aaron now say, his mercy endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord now say, his mercy endures forever. So all the nation of Israel has benefited from the mercy of God over their entire history, and because they've enjoyed his blessings, each one should give thanks unto the Lord. When it says uh, that Israel and the house of Aaron and those who fear the Lord are called to praise him, this would speak of the Jewish nation. This would be speaking of the priests. That's the house of Aaron. And this would be speaking of all who are God-fearers, and they're all called to give thanks to God. In other words, it's a universal call to worship God because God has been good to all mankind. They should thank him for his goodness towards us. They should thank him for his mercy that he has shown. The word mercy in Hebrew is chesed. The word has said, it's been said, has an equivalency to the word in Greek, agape. It speaks of God's love for us, his merciful covenant love that he has. And so he's saying, you need to thank God. You need to thank God because he's been good to you. You need to thank God because he's faithful to you. You need to thank God because he's merciful to you. That's why we thank the Lord. It's a call to worship God because God is good to all. God desires us to have a relationship with him. So in verse 5, continuing, he says, I called on the Lord in distress. The Lord answered, answered me and, and set me in a broad place. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear what can man do to me. The Lord is for me among those who help me. Therefore, I shall see my desire in those who hate me. 
It's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in men. It is best, better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. So notice what he's saying. He's given us a reason why he gives a public testimony. He's saying to them, I called on the Lord in distress, and the Lord answered me and set me in a broad place. When he says, I called on the Lord in distress, the word distress in Hebrew speaks of being cramped or, or confined. I was confined by pressure, affliction, by troubles. And as I was feeling suffocated from this, the Lord has removed me from this, this confining area and has placed me in a place that I am free and I can breathe in. And for that, I give thanks to the Lord because I had been confined and now I've been set free. I was being suffocated, but now I have room to breathe. So he says, I called to the Lord. I called on the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me and set me in a broad place. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Now, I want you to think about this because this is a psalm that was sung by Jesus on the night he was uh, betrayed, and the next day he's to be crucified. But notice what he's singing here. You need to see this. These are the words of the one who's facing the cross. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Jesus Christ, in other words, entrusted himself to his Father, so he went to the cross without fear. In verses 8 and 9, he said, It's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It's better to trust in the Lord than put your confidence in a prince. In other words, we know that we can be disappointed in people. They can fail, even when they don't desire to. Now, I want you to think about this for a moment, because as Jesus was reciting and singing this psalm, he's looking around, and around him are 11 men, one of them has already left him, a man by the name of Judas. And as the Lord Jesus Christ is reciting this psalm, Judas already gone to betray him. He's looking at 11 men. And as he's looking at these 11 men, he's making it very clear there's only one person you can put your confidence in. Now, we think of a man by the name of the Apostle Peter. You see, and remember with me, that night the Lord Jesus Christ had been speaking to the men, and he said, well, all, all of you are going to forsake me tonight. And it cut to the heart of the apostle Peter. It bothered him terribly that Jesus would say that to him. And it's the apostle Peter who said to Jesus, though all forsake you, yet I will never forsake you. I will even die with you. And Jesus, looking back at this beloved man, the apostle Peter, whom I have grown to love through reading the scriptures, a man that I sometimes can identify with. As Jesus was looking back at this guy, he says, are you going to remain faithful to me, Peter? When I tell you this night before the, the rooster crows three times, you're going to deny me three times. The apostle was so upset. He was so hurt. How could you possibly believe that about me? Well, the psalm tells us, don't put your confidence in man. Don't put your confidence in government officials, in princes, because when you do so, you're putting your confidence, your absolute confidence, in the wrong person. There's only one who will never let you down, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one who is closer to you than any brother. He's the one who keeps your tears in a bottle. He's the one who hears your, your pain and your, 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 your prayers. When your best friend might want to do you a, a favor and wishes that they could, but they simply can't come through for you, there's one who can, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus is entrusting himself to his Father. It is better to trust in the Lord. In verse uh, 10, all nations surrounded me, but in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. They surrounded me. Yes, they surrounded me, but in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. They surrounded me like bees. They were, they were quenched like a fire of thorns. For in the name of the Lord... I will destroy them. You pushed me violently that I might fall, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. And so as we're looking at this, this passage here, notice how he says, all nations surrounded me. When he speaks of all nations surrounding him, the fact is, in spite of the adversity, his feelings of anguish are overcome by trusting in the Lord. All nations would represent Rome. Rome was an empire that was made up of many conquered nations, and ultimately that, that, that empire did fall. 
That's what it means when he says, all nations surrounded me, but in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. They surrounded me. Yes, they surrounded me, but in the name of the Lord, I'll destroy them. They surrounded me like bees. They were quenched like a fire of thorns, for in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. Verse 13, you pushed me violently that I might fall, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. You pushed me violently. God is able to keep me and protect me from my enemies. God is able to take care of me. If I put my full confidence in him, if I trust him, it doesn't really matter what people are trying to do if they're trying to knock me down and cause me to stumble. The bottom line is if I keep my eyes on the Lord, then I'm going to be kept safe. In Psalm 116, at verse 8, the psalmist says, You have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. Lord, you are with me. You hover over me. Your arms are protecting me. You keep me strong. In the New Testament book of Jude, verses 24 and 25, we read, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. One of the things that we learn is though we may be pushed, even pushed from behind, it's the Lord who holds us up. This is the essence of Christian faith. It's the Lord God who holds us up. It's the Lord who supports us. It's the Lord who keeps us from falling. It's the Lord who strengthens us and gives us the ability to endure. It's not because we have a strong will. It's not because we have a great disposition. It's because we have a great God. And we have learned to trust in Him. We have learned to, to know that He would be uh, over us, protecting us. That's what Paul talks about in 2 Timothy 4.18 when he says, the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. You pushed me violently that I might fall, but the Lord helped me. Next time you're finding yourself in a situation where you're being knocked down, keep in mind that the Lord is the one who helps you and keeps you strong. Now notice what it says here in verse uh, Verse 14, when he says, The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. Verse 15, The voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die but live and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord has chastened me severely but he has not given me over to death. Now, when he speaks of the right hand of the Lord, if you take notes, the right hand of the Lord is a picture of his, his ability to save. Right hand represents his power. And so the right hand of the Lord is his ability to save. Exodus 15, verse 6 reads, Your right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, has dashed the enemy in pieces. And so he's saying, I will rejoice because you are protecting me. I will rejoice because you are saving me. That's what he's saying in verse 17. I shall not die but live and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord has chastened me severely, but he has not given me over to death. So I will hold strong to his right hand, and I will be protected by him. Now, when he says, I shall not die but, but live, I've been delivered out of my troubles. My hope has been restored. The afflictions I've endured have only strengthened my love and trust in the Lord. This could also be a reference to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ when he says, I shall not die but live and declare the works of the Lord. Verse 19, open to me the gates of righteousness. I will go through them and I will praise the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous shall enter. Now, this is an interesting picture. Have your, in your mind's eye a procession. You have a worship leader. The worship leader is leading the procession. He's coming to the gates there in the temple area, and he cries out, Open unto me the doors of righteousness. So it's a picture of worship leading you into the presence of the Lord. The gates symbolize a protected entrance. And the Bible tells us very often in Scripture that the only way that you can enter into the presence of God is if you have the holiness or the righteousness that enables you to do so. The only way that you can enter into the presence of God is to have the proper kind of garment. If you attempt to enter before the Lord in a garment that is self-fabricated by your own works of righteousness, 
If you attempt to get into the presence of God through your own efforts, your own religious philosophy, your own style of life, the Bible does not recognize that as being acceptable. I find it interesting. I hear this all the time. I heard it just this recently. There was somebody, I forget his name, he's a well-known actor and all, and he died. And then somebody, a friend of his, said that this man, you know, is now looking down from heaven at us. And I guess he figures that because he was an actor and he was well-known, he must have made it into the pearly gates. That's how people think. They think, well, if he was well-known and he had some money and people liked him, he's better than average, that's probably going to qualify him for heaven. We live in a time when everybody goes to heaven. I say this quite often, but it's true. We live in a time when, when, when everybody seems to have access to heaven. Everybody thinks that they're going to go to heaven. I was sharing this just recently. I forget whether it was on Sunday morning or Sunday night or whenever it was, but it bears repetition because I think it's something that I, that, uh, I find interesting, and that is, and I, I don't remember. I wish I could remember. I think it was third service. Some of you may have been there when I asked the question, how many of you watch American Idol? And I think a lot of America, a lot of us do, probably you don't admit it, but you know you watch it, you know, and, and I watch it, and I absolutely blow my mind, and I don't know if it's cruel for me to laugh, because sometimes as I'm watching these people, I'm absolutely amazed at them because they think they can sing, and, and some of them think they can dance, and some of them think they can dance and sing, and then they walk up and they say, I want to sing because I'm the next American Idol, and I'm watching this person and then they just let out something that sounds like somebody hit them with a hammer on their foot, and, and they, it's amazing to me. And, and you put your hands over your ears, and you go, oh, my, they are so bad. Even their mother would say, shut up. I mean, they're bad, you know. They are bad. And as I watch them do that, and then they try and do their moves and everything and sliding around, I'm just losing, and I'm going, oh, my. But, but, but it's, it's not just the entertainment of, of watching somebody. It's the delusion that amazes me. It's, it's, it's not even that they're deceived. It, delusion is stronger than deception. These people are deluded. They actually think that they're stars. They actually think that they've got talent. And then they're telling these people, you're wrong. You don't know how good I really am. You're wrong. I'm the next star. I'll show you. I'm going to get a contract. I'm going to be a big star. And they walk out, and you go, oh, my. Oh, my. They ought to put a, a straight jacket on you, honey, and take you away right now. You're crazy. <laughs> but you know what? They really think they're good, don't they? They really do. And that, I think, is part of the, 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 the whole intent of this show, is to show you they can't hear themselves, and they can't hear criticism. They're American idols in their own mind. But you want to know something? There are a lot of Americans who think they are better than they really are. They think that they're candidates for heaven. And I've discovered it's because spiritually they're tone deaf. They don't realize that they're not as good as they think they are. They think they're much better than they really are. And there is a whole generation right now, and a whole world, that actually thinks itself to be better than it is. And like the American idols, they think that they have what it takes to enter into the kingdom of God. Problem is, is they have no concept of holiness, righteousness. They have no concept of a judge, of a holy judge who judges on the standard of perfection, who judges on the standard of righteousness that no human being can attain. So if we stand before him saying to him, but I tried, I didn't lie that much. I didn't steal that much. I really didn't get angry that much. If we say, well, I tried to keep most of the Ten Commandments and I only broke nine of them, at least one, that ought to allow me in. That's better than average, isn't it? If we have that kind of attitude, then we're, we're, we're hopeless. You know, the Bible says, open up the gates of righteousness. And the only way to enter in through the gates of righteousness is through genuine worship of God and the reception of His righteousness in your life that, that actually is a garment that God gives to you. We are clothed in the righteousness of God through our faith in Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us he has made him sin who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. In order for us to enter into the kingdom of God, we need to have the righteousness of God. And the only way you can have the righteousness of God is if you by faith accept the fact that you're a sinner 
and ask God to be merciful to you. Remember the story of those two individuals who are standing praying, and you have the publican, and you have the, the self-righteous individual, and the self-righteous individual is saying, I thank you, God, that I'm not like other men. I fast and I give my tithes. I'm not even like this publican here. And he's praying to himself in that fashion, but the publican, the tax gatherer, won't even lift his eyes to heaven, but looks down and he's, he's, he's hitting himself in the chest and he's saying, be merciful unto me, Lord, a sinner. And Jesus, in observing this, says, I tell you that that one smiting himself, he's the one who's receiving forgiveness because he recognizes himself to be in need. There's none so blind as the one who will not see. Only the sick will go to a physician. If you're not thinking you're sick, you'll never ask the great physician to heal you. If you don't realize you're a sinner, you're never going to ask for forgiveness. If you look at God like you might look at your grandfather, and your grandfather would kind of smile at you when you did something wrong, and say, oh, it's no big deal. Leave the boy alone. Leave the girl alone. God isn't a heavenly grandfather. He's a father. And as he looks down upon us, what he looks for is for those who in true faith are worshiping him through his son, Jesus Christ. That's the only entrance into heaven. That's the only way you can get in there. You enter in the gates of righteousness through the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So the gates symbolize something that is protected. It's, a, it's an entrance unto the Lord, but only the righteous may pass through in order to worship God. In Revelation, in chapter 22, verses 14 and 15, we read, Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life, and may enter through the gates into the city. But outside are dogs and sorcerers, sexually immoral, murderers and idolaters, and whoever loves and practices a lie. When he says outside, in other words, they have no entrance into this place that is for the righteous. He says outside are dogs. When he speaks of dogs, dogs is a way of speaking of somebody with no relationship with God. When he speaks of sorcerers, immediately we'll think to, within ourselves, well, yeah, you know, these are guys who practice, or women who practice uh, sorcery, uh, magic. The word sorcerer, outside are sorcerers. The word sorcerer in the original language is where we get the word pharmaceutical or drugs from. Sorcerers were individuals who made potions. But it's another way of speaking of those who are abusers of drugs. So he's saying outside are drug abusers. Outside are sexually immoral individuals who are out there having sex without being married. I know that that's not something that people today really think about. I mean, as I've said to you before, it amazes me how people will, will be living with somebody, and they may be living with them for six weeks or six months, and, when they, and you say, and, and who is this, please? And they don't say, it's the person I'm living with. They always say, it's my fiancé. It's my fiancé. And I've discovered what that word means. It means, fiancé means it's the person I'm shacking with. It's person I'm living with. But it doesn't mean that you're married. But a lot of people think it's like being married. There's a show, some of you perhaps have seen it. It's called 24. Anybody here see that show? 24. Interesting. Uh, there's an individual in it. I watch it. I enjoy this show pretty much, to be honest with you. I'm not saying you should watch it, but I have, and I do enjoy it. But I find it interesting. Because at the beginning of this year, this season, you have the... Now, I don't remember what his name is, but he's the hero. And he's with this woman, and this woman and he are together, boyfriend and girlfriend, I guess. And he says, he's talking to her, and she says, my father's old-fashioned. He, really he really wouldn't like the idea of me being with you because I'm still married. You know, and, I, and I'm watching this show, and I say, amazing. I mean, that's exactly the way people think today. It's old-fashioned to honor your vows. It's old-fashioned uh, if you actually think, well, yeah, you are still married. You don't have a divorce. You have no right to be dating. You're with this guy hooking up, but you think because you've fallen out of love that it's okay to have somebody else, even though the law of the land would say you're still a married individual. Now, if the law of the land states that you are because you're not divorced, and separation is not divorce, it isn't old-fashioned if we as Christians would say, now, wait a minute. How can you start a relationship and have a sexual relationship with somebody who's married to somebody else? The Bible calls that adultery, but others call it old-fashioned. But the Bible very clearly says that those who are outside are the sexually immoral. 
as well as the murderers and the idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. Those who enter into the kingdom of God enter in through the righteousness of the gates of righteousness. In verse 20, this is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous shall enter. Verse 21, I will praise you for you have answered me and have become my salvation. God has saved me and I openly and voluntarily give him my praise and I give him my thanks. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Interestingly enough, Jesus quotes this particular psalm in the Gospels. We saw this in Mark chapter 12, verses 10 and 11. And the stone that is being spoken of, obviously, is a reference to Jesus himself. How do we know that? Well, one is he quotes it in reference to himself in Mark 12, but also in the book of Acts, in chapter 4, verses 10 through 12, uh, this is what we read. Let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And so it's a reference to Messiah Jesus Christ. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Now, I want you to pick this up because to me, this is one of the most powerful things, and I'm going to try and develop this for just a second. This is a psalm that Jesus was singing with his disciples. Judas has already gotten up and left. He sold Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver. Jesus, who is the inspirer of Scripture, obviously knows that he is Isaiah 53 personified. He is the one who will soon be wounded. He knows all of Scripture in that he is the author of Scripture. He knows the different psalms that refer to the pain, the torment, the sorrow that he's about to go through. He knows all of this. He's with 11 men, and he knows that those 11 men are also going to forsake him and flee. As he's reciting and singing this psalm, he gets to this verse, this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Knowing the cross was before him, it would almost seem ironic that he would say, this is the day the Lord has made, and I'm going to rejoice in it. That, that, that flies in the face of the typical way that every human being thinks. Every human being would probably at that point be thinking, in just a few hours, I'm going to go through something that no human being has ever endured before. I'm going to be tortured to the point of almost dying. When you look at the scourging of Jesus Christ, and we'll be rehearsing this in just a short while as we go through Easter week, and when you consider all the torture that he's about to endure, how his skin was opened up, how his body was beaten half almost to death, how Jesus was pummeled to the point of being unrecognizable as a human being, how his back was like hamburger opened and lacerated, and they drop on it a rough-hewn cross that actually digs into his sensitive skin. He carries this cross and is crucified on it, yet he says, this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. What an amazing statement. And even as he's singing, it's the day of salvation. This is the day of salvation that I shall be offered I shall be offered up as a sacrifice for man. This is the song that he was singing as he was facing the cross. And in my mind, that is an incredible thing, even as he is singing this with them. This is the day which the Lord has made. We will rejoice. We will be glad in it. Save now, I pray, O oh Lord. O oh Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. God is the Lord, and he has given us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God. I will exalt you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Verses 25 and 26, when it says, save now, it's a Hebrew word, Hosanna. 
It's what the children were singing when Jesus was entering into the city in his triumphal entry. And they were crying out, Hosanna. The word Hosanna is a Hebrew, save now. What we have here in the English, save now, is, is the Hebrew word Hosanna. And they were crying that out as Jesus Christ came in on Palm Sunday. Matthew 21, 9 says, The multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And as the people were laying those palm branches before him and he was making his entry into the city, the Pharisees heard what was going on and they approached Jesus and they said, rebuke your disciples. And that's when Jesus said, I say unto you, that if these should be quiet, the very stones would cry out. Now for us, that doesn't make an awful lot of sense. But when you go to Israel, you will notice that everything there was built in stone. Everything was built in stone. And so what Jesus was saying is if human voices are quiet, the creation of God will, will, will suddenly cry out. You cannot keep this moment from happening. To tell my disciples to be quiet is not possible. But what they were doing is crying out and saying, save now. It's interesting that they also said, send now prosperity. Send now prosperity in verse 25. That word prosperity is a Hebrew word that speaks of success. Cause us to have success. Send prosperity. Cause us to be successful. Bless us is what they're crying out. And as I was thinking about this, that prosperity that they're saying they want only comes through a knowledge of Jesus Christ. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, notice what Paul says. He says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Colossians 2.10, you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. 2 Peter 1.3, his divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and goodness. Somebody was asking me recently about a book that some of you have perhaps read or perhaps are reading. All of you as Christians have probably heard about it. It's the number one seller. It's something related to 40 Days of Purpose. How many of you have heard of that one, 40 Days of Purpose? Raise your hand if you have. I want to see. Okay, some of you haven't. Where have you been? It's a, it's a, it's a book that is selling 25,000 copies a day, and it's been doing so. It's the number one bestseller in the Times um, list of books for, for quite some time now. Rick Warren, a pastor from uh, Saddleback Community Church, is the pastor of that. And somebody was asking about that recently. As a matter of fact, just this last week, they were asking me, uh, David, do you know, what do you think about 40 Days of Purpose? Being in the book, 40 Days of Purpose, my response is just what my pastor Chuck's is. Well, I think that if you spend 40 days in the Bible, you're going to find your purpose. Instead of picking up a book and reading it, not to say it's a good or bad book. I don't really care about it. I haven't read it. All I know is 40 days in the Bible will give me the purpose that I need. People right now want to find their purpose. The Bible reveals what your purpose is. People right now want to have prosperity. They want to have success. The Bible reveals how you can have success. How do you have success? Commit your heart to Jesus Christ and follow him every day. As you do that on a daily basis, he blesses you as you pursue him. If you decide not to, if you decide to live your own life for yourself, you're not going to have the blessings that God wants to give to you because you're not placing yourself in the position to receive because you're not walking in faith. But when you understand that the Lord Jesus Christ has provided for you everything that you need and that what you need to embrace is him and his word and his spirit, when you actually embrace it and understand that, God will bless your life. You know, as I got saved, when I got saved, I was 20 years old. I'd been abusing drugs and alcohol for about five years at that point. I know some in this church, that's lightweight to them because they, they abused for so much longer. I was 15. I, I got saved when I was 20. I abused for five years. But I can tell you something. When I got saved, I didn't get into a 10-step program. When I got saved, I went into a one-step program, one step to Jesus Christ, and he transformed all of my life. When you come to the Lord and his word and you say, God, be merciful to me, I'm a sinner, I need your help. And Lord, I don't want to gradually get better. I know that's going to happen. I'm going to gradually be a different person. But God, I need instant help right now. And I've discovered something. I've discovered, check this out, that the Holy Spirit who raised Jesus Christ from the dead resides in me. I've discovered that the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead dwells in me, the power of the Holy Spirit. And I've also discovered that God's word is true. 
And God never lies. And if God says he's going to begin something, God's going to continue, and he's going to complete that which he has begun. And so when God begins a work in you and you embrace him by faith and say, God, be merciful to me, change my life, send now prosperity, God, give me success, he's going he's gonna to do that. He's going to transform you. Now, if I get distracted by other things, if I pursue things to my own hurt, that's my problem. I'm making decisions that, that God isn't going to honor because God's word tells me what he wants for me. If I want to argue with him, I'm not going to win the argument. But if I embrace what he says, and even go so far as I have in the past, that I don't understand this, so I'm just going to trust you in it, then I'll discover later on that the Lord's word is true and right, and he actually reveals his ways to me. But if I want to debate with him all day long and argue with him all day long as if I know the universe better than he does, then I'm probably not going to receive the things that he wants from me. So the psalmist is crying out, and this is what, what the people would say. They would say, save now, I pray, O Lord. O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. God is the Lord, and he has given us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, I will exalt you. I'll give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. I have an unyielding commitment to you. And that sacrifice is permanently yours. And I will praise and I will exalt you and I will give you thanks both here on earth and forever. Why? Because you're, you are good and your mercy is not just for today. Your mercy endures forever. So I can trust you today and I can trust you tomorrow and I can trust you into eternity because your mercy doesn't have a place where it runs out. But it continues and continues and continues because I need his mercy to continue and continue and continue. And so truly, we should give thanks to the Lord because he is good and because his mercy endures forever.